Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Chatham Heights Baptist Church, our midweek Wednesday of prayer time and of Bible study, and maybe a little reflection thrown in as well. So I welcome you joining us today, and you're watching it now or perhaps watching it on your own time later on. That's perfectly fine as well. Before we begin our Bible study, um, and uh, Bible study and then prayer time. I was on Twitter early this morning and I ran across this article from Baptist News Global. It's an opinion piece by Brett Younger, who um, I've always liked a lot of stuff that he's written. Uh, he's a, a Baptist pastor. And uh, one of the things uh, I thought, I just thought he nailed this uh, in terms of capturing the moment. Uh, I've already had some people who've, you know, made some statements, not necessarily under my posting of this, but other people's posting about, you know, breaking up the minutia. But Brett is capturing the moment of ourselves uh, and where we are here in America and then where the world is. And uh, I would never normally do something like this. I would say, go look at it and read it yourself. But a lot of you don't. <laughs> So I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes today um, sharing this with you, and then we'll get to our Bible study. But I want you to think about um, where Brett Younger is going with this as we prepare for Easter this coming Sunday. Next Sunday, people in the United States will wish Easter felt like it did three years ago. They'll put on new shoes and wonder if they should have gotten a half size larger. They'll consider going out for pancakes, but abandon that plan and just search through the plastic grass at the bottom of their children's Easter baskets for the traditional resurrection breakfast of the Cadbury egg. <laughs> Some of the visitors will get to church before Sunday school is over and they'll take the best seats and they'll be blissfully unaware of the members on the pew behind them who are burning that we sit there every Sunday holes in the backs of their Easter bonnets. A few will wonder why we do not sing up from the grave he arose anymore. As they pass the offering plate, they'll glance at their watches. When the preacher reads about the broken-hearted women who stumbled to the tomb of the kindest person they'd ever known, they will glance at their watches again. And as they leave, they will almost ask the minister, why is it every time that I come to church you preach on the resurrection? But they think better of it and comment, all oh, the lilies are so pretty. They'll go to lunch at a restaurant that booked more reservations than it has chairs. When they finally get a table, they will eat too much. On Monday, someone will ask, how was your Easter? And they'll answer, well, better than last year. On Easter Sunday, People in Kiev will wish Easter felt like it did three years ago. They will put on their best clothes and make their way to the 800 churches in the city. Sanctuaries will be decorated with rearranged funeral arrangements. As the preacher reads about the women with tears in their eyes going to the graveyard, everyone there will know exactly what that feels like. They will think about people they have lost. After Russian forces recently withdrew, the bodies of more than 400 civilians were found in and around Kiev. The count keeps rising. Some will think about a woman who lived in Bukha, a suburb northwest of Kiev. Irina Fokina, 53. She raised two daughters who crossed the border into Poland but Irena stayed to help, and she fed those who were sheltering in a shopping center and cooked for the Ukrainian military. On March 5th, Irena tried to get a seat in one of the cars that was evacuating people from the shopping center, but when there was no room, she decided just to ride her bicycle home. CNN shared the chilling drone footage that captures the moment that Russian forces killed Irena. She rounds the corner on her bike and is gunned down. And a second video shows her lying next to her bike, dead as Jesus on the cross. Irena had gotten a 
cherry red manicure for Valentine's Day with a heart on one finger, and her hand is visible with the red nail polish and the heart motif on one finger. Her daughter, Sharuk, said, I want the picture of her hand to be a symbol of new beginnings. This symbol tells the occupiers they can do anything to us, but they cannot take the main thing, love. On Easter Sunday in Kiev, Christians will think about how long they have prayed for peace and how abandoned they may feel. Some of the ministers no doubt thought about canceling their Easter services. But what do you say when death crushes life? But perhaps for just a moment during the Ukrainian equivalent of Christ the Lord is risen today, they will sing, Made like him, like him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave the skies and the light of hallelujah will flicker in the devastating darkness Easter is not for those whose only worries are that their shoes are too tight or the line at the restaurant too long Easter is for those who have been to the cemetery in Kiev on Sunday Christians will share the story of Jesus death and resurrection in its pain and its glory. The truth of Easter is that the darkness is overwhelming. But no matter how horrible the night, light will come in the morning. Thank you, Brett Younger, for those words for us as we prepare for Easter. We are going to pick up or go to our next prophet, our biggest prophet in some ways. And I say that merely because it encompasses the most words, <laughs> chapters, verses, which didn't exist when they wrote it, but you know what I mean. It gives source of order to the writings of Isaiah, the poetic prophet, if ever there was one, uh, and yet at the same time, so many deep theological revelations for us that God gives Isaiah to share. The name Isaiah means literally Yahweh gives salvation. Could there be a more apropos name for the prophet? Most scholars have, we've, or we've always known Isaiah had 66 books, the way we've measured it off, in the, uh, in, in the book. And yet, most scholars have identified for a long time through research that Isaiah probably contains three different eras, three different writers, prophet writers. Tones change, and it's obvious that the circumstances of the historical context changes. In the first 39 chapters, most scholars call that first Isaiah, the original prophet of name. Uh, he spends a lot of time on judgment, meeting out judgment, talking about the judgment of God for Israel. Um, his tone is it. There is promise in it, but there is also severe judgment. We use a lot of Isaiah's words to uh, reach backwards, to pull forwards into the birth narrative of our Savior Jesus, because we see the hints from Isaiah's writing and prophetic writing that really lines up with the person of the Incarnation. Now, the second part of Isaiah begins in chapter 40 and lasts, most believe, till 55. And most people look at it that way because it seems that the context and the situation has changed from those first 39 chapters. The exile has already taken place, which is a couple of hundred years later. And 
the exiles themselves are near the end of that time of enslavement in Babylon. Um, when the section in 40 through 55, the prophet speaks of judgment, it appears now in past tense, as if judgment has already been meted out, which is exactly what happened with Babylon destroying Jerusalem. Uh, in fact, second Isaiah speaks of a new exodus, a return to the promise of land from God. Um, in fact, second Isaiah speaks of individuals who historically are much later than the first segment of Isaiah. Cyrus, the Persian, the Mede, if you will, is mentioned in chapter 45. Uh, Babylon itself in chapters 43 and 47 uh, share uh, direct words. And in the original Isaiah, that Babylon uh, power didn't really exist in that way. And then chapters 56 through 66, the last 10, if you will, um, seem to be written shortly after Israel and Jerusalem have kind of been restored or they're on their way to restoring it. Uh, they seem to be, most of them, back in Jerusalem. And there's little to no reference of Babylon anymore because if it is later, and we have mentioned Cyrus a little bit before, then Babylon does not exist. It has been conquered by Persia and the Medes. So when is Isaiah speaking to us? Well, you know, if one person wrote all three segments, all 66 chapters, they would have to have lived well over 200 plus years old. And it, and that's not, I'm not poo-pooing that because we know of Noah and Methuselah and Moses uh, had 120 years. But, you know, the reality is that the way the tones change and everything changes, you get the sense that that there's a new prophet who is then just added to the prophetic collection of Isaiah. When is Isaiah originally speaking? Well, we're told towards the very beginning, in the year that King Uzziah died, well, who in the world is Uzziah? Well, he died around 742 BC. He had been the king who was the contemporary of the ones we already talked about, Amos and Hosea and Micah. And um, Uzziah dies early in the life of the prophet Isaiah. He is the king in Judah from 783 to 742 BC. In the north, in the northern kingdom, Jeroboam II was the king. When Uzziah originally came to the throne, well before prophet Isaiah wrote, he was only 16. And he came to the throne because his, his dad, the king, had been murdered, assassinated. He was an aggressive king. Um, he expanded Judah and its land and its influence in a time and a period when there was kind of a political vacuum in that part of the Middle East. And he was known because most of his tenure, which was a long one, uh, produced tranquility in Judah, good commerce, peace. One of the things we know about uh, Uzziah is that he contracted leprosy. And he shared power with his son after that, his son Jotham, who followed him up somewhere about uh, eight years before Uzziah died. And then Jotham became king after Uzziah, sole king from 742 to 735. So he was only king for about seven years. And he kind of kept up what his dad had been doing. Uh, he was an energetic, energetic builder and a warrior. Yeah, you can look for that in Second Chronicles 27 for the mention of Jotham and a little bit of what he did in his reign. And then Jotham was followed by the king that would vex <laughs> Isaiah the most. The king whom, for the most part, the first part of Isaiah really, really spoke to. Ahaz. Not Ahab as you think about you know, Moby Dick, but Ahaz with a Z at the end. Ahaz's big problem as a king was that he became king at the wrong time. Kind of like Herbert Hoover became president of the United States at the wrong time. You know, the crash happened, the depression hit, and it really wasn't Hoover's fault. It just happened. 
happens other times throughout history of someone who becomes king or president at the wrong moment in the wrong time of history. Um, but why? Well, Assyria had begun to assert itself in the northern region coming down into the Middle East. It was Assyria was led by a guy, and you gotta love these king names back then. Tilgath Pileser the Third. I would hate to have seen his signature, but then again, uh, he appears on the scene, um, and Ahaz decides he has to protect himself. So he gets into um, a, a a treaty, if you will with the king of Damascus, his name is Rezin, R-E-Z-I-N, and with Pekka of Samaria. And Damascus and Samaria invade Judah in 734. Uh, but uh, let me back that up. Those two were the ones who invaded Judah. But in order to fight them off, Ahaz formed an alliance uh, with Assyria. And Isaiah would protest that he would say you you don't do this sort of thing if you do this thing uh it will bring ruination to you and ahaz doesn't pay any attention so ahaz appealed to assyria who crushed then the two samaria and uh damascus um but what happened was what isaiah said would happen um Assyria said, we'll leave you guys alone, but uh, you will be here for our bidding. Basically, Assyria makes Judah a puppet state. You'll do what we ask you to do when we ask you to do it. Then, after Ahaz is gone from the scene in 715, there comes Hezekiah. Hezekiah is one of those interesting kings that you kind of think about when you look at his and you see good and you see not so good. Uh, he has precarious power, but he reestablished some worse things. For example, he brought worship back to the temple. Now you're thinking, how did worship not show up at the temple? Because it wasn't a priority to Ahaz. It wasn't a priority to Jotham. And so, you know, the, the, the temple kind of got a refurbishment. And one of the things that Hezekiah also did was kind of break away from Assyria, brought political independence to Judah for the time as Assyria was falling from the scene. And one of the other things that happened was that Hezekiah brought a revival in faith in Yahweh. And that revival expelled the pagan idols that had shown up in places of worship and within the context of the culture and 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 they began to pass over to celebrate the passover again in the temple that's right passover celebration had been cast away cast aside nobody cared to celebrate it think anything about it for a long time except maybe in homes but then under hezekiah's rule the temple and the priests said no we will we will bring back the passover and then Hezekiah formed an alliance with Babylon in order to minimize Assyria's threat and influence. Now, if you remember how Isaiah responds to Ahaz, what do you think Isaiah, Isaiah thinks and says to Hezekiah about getting this alliance with the Babylonians? Yeah, in chapter 39, he denounced this act. But what happened was Assyria reasserted themselves and they forced hezekiah to surrender and would remain a vassal state to assyria to the end of hezekiah now let's talk for just a moment who in the world was isaiah so we've given you context of when this first part of isaiah was written by the prophet isaiah well all we here's what we know about isaiah isaiah was the son of a man by the name of amos now there's no direct evidence though there's some conjecture of priestly family being involved in the temple worship. However, it is obvious that he is at home in the temple and at home in the courts. So it, he has either been pledged to the priests to grow up in the temple and in the education and the nurturing of the priests, or he's at least a man of social standing. 
not an outsider to the temple world. Um, so from the reading, those that's the best we can deduce. And he writes a lot of what we would call oracles, words of prophecy, uh, in which he brings back the imagery of the David monarchy, the Davidic monarchy. Uh, he really does a lot of re-emphasizing we, we need to recapture that David fervor. Most people had forgotten, not forgotten, but David had you know, fallen into a lot of, um, well, the dusty pages of history for Judah. But now Isaiah says we need to concentrate and get back to the Davidic line of that. He was married to a prophetess. In chapter 8, verse 3, it mentions her. And they have two children. Now, these names are worth uh, their weight in gold for a prophet. Uh, he has one child whose name is Shear Jejub, which means, roughly translated, a remnant will return. You know, like Hosea had those names for his kids. You know, kids that were named not mine. <laughs> And uh, those kinds of things. Well, Isaiah's, a lot of prophets named their children after something prophetic they were getting across. I'm thankful that that wasn't the case with my name. And you probably are about yours. Another child of his that's listed is Maler Shalal Hashbaz, which means the spoil speeds, the prey hastes. Yeah, that's, that's really an hmm, interesting thought. Um, this first section, and if you want to call it the ministry of the original Isaiah, kind of gets divided into four sections. Uh, his early ministry, which is probably sometime lasting about eight years, he experiences his call to be a prophet of God, and he speaks of Uzziah's death being the, the moment that brought it all together. And as I say every week, Scripture is not written in a vacuum. It takes place in a context. And it's good for us to know what is the crisis in the context that brings it about, because the truth of the matter is, in the Old Testament uh, prophet world, they came in, at the right time, the right place, and the right moment to share something God wanted his people to know. So it's good to know what it was and, and where it came from then. Um, he indicts the nation for being greedy, for arrogance, despite prosperity. They are arrogant people. They are greedy people, he declares to them. Uh, he is there in that first early ministry during the uh, Northern Kingdom versus Syria. Uh, so he sees all of that that's going on up north to their cousins. Uh, and then all of a sudden, after that crisis passes, uh, in the beginning chapters, um, he retreats, it seems, from public life. At, at best, he gives his words over to some followers. But the middle part of his ministry then comes back up. He he, he comes along some, um, oh, 15 years later. He comes back on the scene of what's happening around him, and he redirects that same message no longer uh, to Syria, but to Assyria. And he gets a little eccentric. Uh, let me see if I can, I should be able to pull this up for you, um, simply because, you know, we forget that sometimes the prophets are eccentric people. And you wouldn't maybe like them as your pastor, not because they were, what's the word, hellfire and damnation, but because they do some odd things. For example, in chapter 20, during this threat with Assyria, and to get his point across, uh, let me go back to it here, yes. Uh, in chapter 20, verses 3 and 4, then God said, just as my servant Isaiah was walked around town naked and barefooted for three years as a warning sign to Egypt and Ethiopia. So the king of Assyria is going to come and take the Egyptians as captives. 
and the Ethiopians as exiles. Um, it, he, Isaiah walks around naked for three years to depict, depict the fate of the people who rely on their military acumen and strength rather than on God. And that's what Isaiah tells them, that God is saying through his nakedness. Aren't we grateful that not all of us are called to be prophets? Uh, there are two key or oracles that we'll talk about in just a little bit that we're so familiar with, particularly come Christmas time. Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, we'll get to those in a minute. Uh, that kind of happened in the, in the middle part of his ministry. And then the latter part of his ministry, the crisis of... Um, open defiance uh, of Assyria by Hezekiah. Um, you know, Isaiah speaks in the midst of that. The, uh, the result is, uh, in Assyria, the king of that moment in history, a guy named Sargon II, died. And when he died, it left this, um, it left Assyria weakened. And so it emboldened Hezekiah to ally with Egypt for protection rather than God. And just like before, Isaiah says, don't keep doing the same mistakes. And yet they do. So what is Isaiah speaking about in these first 39 chapters? What is it he's trying, the message he's trying to get across of God? Well, first of all, he, he, his a theme of theology for him is that Yahweh is a holy God who demands justice and righteousness from the people. It's evident from his very calling text in uh, Isaiah chapter 6 uh, that we know so well uh, that, uh, you know, when he looked up and there was God high and lifted up and the angels, the seraphim and cherubim are flying around and and, and all of that, it, it is in his calling that you discover this is why he's being called, that God wants to uh, remind his children of the need for justice and righteousness from them. Um, he wants us to understand that Yahweh is not only holy, he is separate and higher than humanity. Uh, and God wants us to act as God is acting not as our sinful nature acts a second thing that isaiah is getting across is that um what is the definition of sin and he says sin is rebellion against yahweh god doing the opposite of what god expects us to do way of life is conducted uh, and and the way life is conducted you have you have corrupted it with greed with corruption with oppression of the poor you trust your own might and your own political alliances rather than trusting in God. So, you know, Isaiah's trying to get that across. He's also trying to help them, help us see that Yahweh God calls for repentance and faith out of love for them. God wants them to repent because uh, he has such a deep abiding love for his children. Um, and he talks about sacrifice, but sacrifice is nothing if the life, if your life and your activities do not change, if your actions are not different. He has sin and rebellion. He talks about sin and rebellion have consequences or judgment. The subjugation by others is a consequence to the lack of faith. In other words, you, you know, the kings uh, of um, Ahaz and Hezekiah who are making these treaties in order to uh, make themselves seem or appear stronger, you're doing that because you don't trust God to protect you. And then he tells them also there will be a remnant that is going to survive, that is going to be saved as my children. God's activity is to cleanse and to restore, not to destroy. The nation will be gone, but the people will remain. And then, of course, the greatest one we mentioned a moment ago was the lineage of promise. The lineage of David will remain. Of course, we come to understand that as followers of Christ, that it had an application to their moment, but it also had an application to the future, meaning the incarnate one, Jesus, his son. Now, those 
those texts that are so key to Isaiah. Chapter 6 of, of Isaiah, we are so very, very familiar with in, in the calling. But sometimes we we miss it. So I go to my trusty friend, Frederick Beekner, who had this description of a calling of Isaiah that I've always loved and continue to go back to, to make me chuckle and to also help me see the profound of the scriptures for Isaiah. There were banks of candles flickering in the distance, clouds of incense thickening the air with holiness stinging his eyes. And then high above him, as if it had always been there, but was only now seen for what it was, like a face in the leaves of a tree or seeing a bear among the various stars put together. There, there was the mystery itself, whose gown was the incense and the candles a dusting of gold at the hem. There were winged creatures shouting back and forth, the way excited children shout to each other when dusk calls them home. And the whole vast reeking place started to shake beneath his feet like a, a wagon going over cobbles. And he cried out, oh God, I am done for. I am foul of mouth and the member of a foul mouth race. When my own two eyes, I have, with my own two eyes, I have seen him. I'm a goner, and I'm sunk. Then one of the winged things touched his mouth with fire and said, There, it'll be all right now. And the mystery, which is Beekner's extra phrase for God, the mystery itself said, Who will it be? And with charred lips, he said, Me. So mystery said, go. Mystery said, go. And give the deaf Hades to your blue in the face. And go show the blind heaven to you drop in your tracks. Because they'd sooner eat ground glass than swallow the bitter pill that puts roses in the cheeks and a gleam in the eyes. Go do it. Isaiah said, do it to win. And the mystery said, till that place freezes over. Mystery said, do it till the cows come home. And that is what a prophet does for a living. And starting from the year that King Uzziah died, when he saw and heard all these things, Isaiah went and did it. Isaiah was so aware that day of the presence of God that he saw him and had this vision through the smoke of worship. And these seraphim, these burning ones, recognize the influence of their song on our own hymnody, holy, 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 you know, that denotes the other than of God, that God is so great that God has even more mysterious things that care for him. Calling to Isaiah is announced, go, and Isaiah says, I will, and how long and he says keep doing it and you will be my voice and you will speak my words that's key to understanding all that isaiah the prophet is going to do he's going to speak god's words and not his because nobody else is speaking them at that moment now we're also very familiar with just a chapter over in chapter 7 in verses 10 through 7, 17, excuse me, 10 through 17, God spoke to Ahaz. This time he said, ask for a sign from your God. Ask anything. Be extravagant. Ask for the moon. By the way, I'm reading from the message today by Eugene Peterson. But Ahaz said, I'd never do that. I'd never make demands like that on God. So Isaiah told him, then listen to this, government of David. It's bad enough that you make people tired with your pious, timid hypocrisies, but now you're making God tired. So the master is going to give you a sign anyway. Watch for this. A girl who is a virgin will become pregnant. 
shall bear a son and name him Emmanuel, God with us. And by the time the child is 12 years old, able to make moral decisions, the threat of war will be over. Relax. Those two kings that you've worried so worried will, will be out of the picture. But also be warned. God will bring on you and your people and your government a judgment worse than anything since the time the kingdom split when Ephraim left Judah. For the king of Assyria is coming. Now, you kind of recognize some of that, even though it wasn't in the familiar King James version of that. Uh, Isaiah comes to Ahaz and Ahaz and says, ask God for a sign. And Ahaz reluctantly and almost doggedly refuses. Oh, well, that's because we don't want to test God. Okay, maybe. Maybe it's because... Ahaz doesn't want to hear the answer. Sometimes we don't ask the question of anyone or of God because we know what the answer is about to be. We just don't want to do that. We fear it. God, through Isaiah, says, be that way, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Now he says... Uh, we're used to, and a virgin shall conceive, and that's fine. That's a good, you know, fairly good translation. Though the Hebrew word that is used is a little different in nuance. Uh, it is the word almah, which is not the normal word that you would use for the word virgin, which is bethula. So in a sense, a young woman will give birth. A young woman who is virgin will give birth, and that birth shall be Emmanuel, God with us. Now, why am I laying nuances with this word am i doubting the you know the the virgin birth no not at all what i am saying is what we discover particularly in isaiah are that these prophetic words are first addressed to a particular time and a particular people in a particular context and what is happening around them this is a first a word for Ahaz and the children of God in Judah. That's the word. God will be with us and you will discover that the threat that you fear will be gone shortly. And God will be the one who did it. Now, centuries pass. Jesus is born. Jesus lives, dies, is resurrected, and ascends back into heaven. The church experiences Pentecost. Some more decades go by as the word begins to spread. Finally, as many who were first-hand witnesses of Christ or who have knowledge of the first-hand story of Christ begin to realize that they need to put in some written form the story of Christ. Matthew, one of his disciples, begins to write his story of his experience with Jesus. And at the beginning of that, in setting the table, he, rem he remembers this text from Isaiah. And he remembers Isaiah 7. And he thinks about it, and he realizes that in Ahaz's day, this was a sign that God was with him. But... Matthew is saying in chapter 1, let me tell you the story of when God really was with us, as in God came and was with us, born to us, lived among us, died for us, raised again for us, and it is in Jesus. So, who is the young women? One of them is in Ahaz's time, but Matthew says the real virgin who conceived is here in Mary and in Jesus' birth. The prophet's words are for their moment, but then they are also words that are timeless from God to all of us. 
So um, we're going to pick up a little bit more on that and about um, the other couple of uh, important texts in Isaiah that let us know, um, you know what God is sharing with us. Looking at our prayer concerns and our announcements, a reminder that here in our sanctuary, tomorrow night, 7 p.m., we worship together celebrating Monday, Thursday, and communion at the Lord's table with our brothers and sisters, First Baptist. They are coming here at Chatham Heights to share in this worship time together. On Friday, Good Friday, we will return the favor. We will be journeying to First Baptist that we may all share together in worship of our Lord and Christ on that Good Friday and the cross that is coming soon. On Easter Sunday, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, we'll be worshiping in both those hours and we will be celebrating the resurrection of our Jesus. But we still have yet to go through the dark night of the soul on Thursday and the cross on Friday and the grave on Saturday. So don't jump to Easter, but remember, we will follow the journey all the way. One other quick note uh, to bring to your attention, and that is that on Sunday, May 8th, which is Mother's Day, we will be having our usual child dedication service in the 11 o'clock service. If you would like to participate, if you have a child who perhaps has not been dedicated in the last couple of years because of COVID or for whatever reason, I invite you to contact us so we can talk together about participating in that special sacred time of worship. On May 22nd, we will be honoring our high school graduates. And in honoring them, we will be uh, pledging to pray for them as they go from one great milestone into a new part of their lives. In our prayer concern time, remember Matt Fouts, who continues to undergo treatment in Houston, Texas for his cancer. Hyla and Holland and Eli have gone down now to Houston. They are there today to spend some time with Matt. Uh, Continue to lift all of them up in your prayers. Carolyn Evans, uh, who had some suspicious uh, tests that may be breast cancer, she meets with the doctor tomorrow to discuss those and next steps. So please keep her in your prayers and Larry, her husband, in your prayers if you would. Continue to uh, remember Kay Cokerham. She had a heart catheterization yesterday. Uh, it, it was good. It, it showed there was no problem with her heart, so her breathing issues are perhaps related to a couple of other things, and they're going to now focus on some of those things in their testing. Lewis Harris, who has uh, been a week now on his uh, radiation treatments, talked to him yesterday, and uh, uh, so far, so good, doing well with that. Continue to remember Mitchell Turner. I ran into Morgan Turner the other day, his wife, and she said that he is uh, recovering pretty well from the surgery. Remember, he had breaks in his ankle from uh, uh, serving our community as a deputy. And, uh, you know, they're going to be having rehab in the near future. Uh, Morgan did confess his biggest, um, uh, what, what was, how was it she put it? His, the, the thing that's most got him uh, frustrated is he can't play golf on these beautiful days. So uh, I hate that uh, for him. Please remember Ukraine and all that's happening there, if you would. And, of course, as they hunt for the person in, from the New York shootings and the subway there. There are a lot of things, a lot of people that we need to pray for and about. So let us bow together. Lord, before you now, we lift up so many. And we pray that you, Lord, would, would bless each person in the context of each of their circumstances to let them know that the power of your presence is near that your healing touch is upon them and that we will trust you as you've called us to trust you for all things and in all things so we lift you up now 
as we follow you down this week that we call holy. In Jesus Christ, amen. Reminder, we talked about last week, uh, you know, Bobby Metters passed away unexpectedly, he lives in the Chatham Heights area. His sister is um, Liza White, former member here at Chatham Heights, and his services, uh, visitation is one o'clock at Bright Funeral Home Friday, and uh, kind of just a, a memorial remembrance at three o'clock. So uh, continue to remember that family in your prayers. Looking forward to worship with you. We are having some special things coming up and hope that you can join us either online or in person this Holy Week.